It's Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. Uh, this is the time I get to spend with you guys and of course answer all your questions. And as many of you know, I've, I've been out for the last two weeks. Uh, so I was on, uh, I was on a well-needed vacation. Uh, so I know it's been a while since the last Hump Day. Uh, and so what I thought today, well, we, we should just go ahead and uh, kick it old school, right? So there's probably a, a plenty of pent up questions out there. Uh, it's been a few weeks since I've been able to answer any of them. So uh, we are back. We're back in action. I'm super excited to be back here at Pure. Uh, and so today we're going to kick it old school and we're just going to answer questions. We're going to try to get through as many of these as we can. Uh, and then, of course, next week, then we'll kind of kick it back up a notch with, uh, with, with a more formal presentation and everything else, okay? But I'm sure you guys have been dying to ask questions here for a few weeks. Uh, so I will talk about anything plastic surgery related, really. So it can be about the different procedures. It can be about post-op care, pre-op care, uh, really anything that you need to know. Uh, and you know that it's going to be great, reliable information because it's coming from a double board certified plastic surgeon right here, okay? More All than right. 100 people. All right. More Perfect. than 100. Beautiful. All right, guys. So, so we're ready to roll. All right? Yes. Uh, let's go with uh, question number one. Oh, one more thing. Si tienen preguntas en español, eh, les quiero recordar que también se habla español, okay? Así que, por favor, tírenme las preguntas en español y se las contesto también, okay? All right, everybody. Who's ready to get started? The first one, can you get hip revision with a tummy tuck? So for, the, you know, if it's not something extremely extensive, then actually a lot of, a lot of times we can do that. So remember, when we're doing the tummy tuck, uh, we can remove a thousand cc's of fat via liposuction. And typically we focus that on the flanks and the waist so that we can kind of really bring out that shape. Um, and then we don't necessarily have to throw that fat away. Uh, so we do have a thousand cc's of fat to work with. And for most kind of hip revisions, um, you don't need any more than that. So if we, want to, if we need to do like a small touch up here or there, uh, then a lot of times we can do that um, at the time of the tongue and tuck. Yes. All right. Yes. The second one the says, uh, you don't do person to person appointments only through virtual. So that's not exactly true, but we do have uh, three different ways of appointments basically. Okay. Uh, which can be done, which can be done, you know, at different times. And of course there's different kind of costs related to it. So the, the, I would say probably the most efficient way of getting in is through the virtual consult, which is where you're, what you're referring to. So you go to our website, which is www.pureplasticsurgery.com. And then there's, you're going to find a button there that says virtual consult and you hit that. And then through there, you're able to put all, you know, all the needed information and your photos okay and then i can take a look at that and we can come up with the surgical plan so that's the most probably the most efficient and the most common way that we do things uh and the cost for that is zero dollars right free virtual consults and the next step up is what we call the video consult so yeah a lot of our patients are from out of town so if you're from a different state or a different country even uh then we can certainly do that via video uh, and we can set those up as well, but there is going to be a cost associated with that. Um, don't quote me exactly. I think it's something like, like $250 or $225, uh, something in that range for the video console. Okay. And then lastly, uh, is the in-person console. So that's when you come in, uh, and do the console here in person. Uh, and that's going to have uh, a cost of $500. So, uh, so yes, so you have three different tiers three different costs, um, and the choice is up to you. We can do it uh, any which way you want. Okay. The now, uh, I'm sorry, one last point though. though that the cost of the console, if you, if you go ahead and book, and we do the surgery, it goes towards your surgery, right? It's not in addition to the cost of the surgery. Yeah, yeah. and one thing that we have openings for August, just right now, new openings, so if you want that's to- a, Yeah, that's right. So uh, we've had a, a couple people that had to kind of move their surgery date, um, so we have a few open spots in August. So if someone is kind of quite ready and they're able to get their labs in and do their uh, all their medical clearances and everything else, and you want a uh, spot in August, uh, you should uh, give us a call right away or go to that um, to that website that we said, the virtual console at www.pureplasticsurgery.com. Okay. Right. Do you do lipo the front with a tummy tuck? All right, so the, where we focus most of the lipo, so we're, we're doing the tummy tuck, right? Um, 
Most of the lipo is focused in this area here that we call the flanks, okay? Now, do I, so the question is, do I do lipo kind of in the central belly area? For the most part, the answer is no. Okay, so that skin there is the same skin that we're getting underneath and, when, and we're undermining it. And when we undermine the skin, we undermine it all the way up to here, okay? That's the bottom of the sternum or the breastbone. It's called the cyphoid process. We undermine all the way up there and up to the level of the ribs so that we can really stretch that down and remove as much skin as possible. Now, when we do that, of course, by definition, we're already cutting off some of the blood supply to that skin, okay? So if you cut off that blood supply and then on top of that, you start really, really hitting it with the liposuction, you can get into trouble, okay? You can get into what's called skin necrosis or skin death, or you can have issues with wound healing and you can then, that could then lead to like open wounds and wound care, okay? So I typically don't do lipo to this area. Now the one thing that we can do though, uh, sometimes if you're the right candidate, not for all candidates, okay? But if you're the right candidate, what we can do is do a little lipo here centrally, and when we do the flanks, we kind of extend it out a little bit towards here, and we can do a little bit of what we call like an etching with your tummy tuck. Um, and that is a possibility for the right candidate, where we kind of etch things out with your tummy tuck there. Okay? Okay, let's go to the next one and say... En Español. Okay. Vamos en Español. Okay, vamos en Español. Dice, para manchas, ¿En los glúteos y en la zona íntima hay algo que se pueda hacer? Eh, sí hay posibilidades, eh, no es algo que hacemos aquí eh, en Pure Plastic Surgery, pero eh, puedes ir a un, a, a un dermatólogo eh, que también lo puede hacer. Hay eh, o cremas eh, o láser, eh, son dos posibilidades que pueden ayudar con esas áreas. Ok, another question. Do you do tummy tuck? Uh, do you do the Exparel shot for tummy tucks? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question and I highly, highly recommend it, okay? So what is Exparel? So Exparel is uh, essentially like a long-acting numbing medication. Uh, you know, like, kind of like that Novocaine that they, they put in your teeth when you go to the dentist? Um, so it's similar to that, but uh, the way that it's, it's compounded, it can last for up to 72 hours, which is great. It makes your recovery from a tummy tuck much, much easier, much, much more tolerable. And where do we inject it? So we inject it at the time of the procedure along the muscle repair and then of course along the incisions as well. So really for all our tummy tucks, for all our mommy makeovers, which include the tummy tuck, um, I highly, highly recommend the x -Pro. Okay, when can you begin to smoke or drink after a BBL and those back lipo with body tight include bar fat area okay okay two All questions right. in one yeah so first question um when should so smoking smoking is you know something that that could become a problem right we need to have all the nicotine out of your system on surgery day so i i highly recommend you know no smoking at all for 30 days before surgery up until through 30 days after surgery, okay? Extremely important, why is that? So nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. That means that it makes your blood vessels smaller. So if your blood vessel is normally this wide, when you have nicotine in your system, it's this wide, okay? Um, and so that means less blood flow, less oxygenation, less nutrients. What does that do? It affects wound healing. So wounds can heal as well, so the chances of your wound breaking down are much higher. It also affects, you know, there's less, uh, your body has less defenses, right? Because the blood flow is not getting there. So the rate of infection goes up. So infection goes up, wound healing problems go up, necrosis, skin dying or fat dying goes up. All right. So you do not want to have any nicotine in your system. You got to stop all nicotine 30 days before to 30 days after surgery. Alcohol, we're not as strict, okay? Doesn't necessarily affect the wound healing in this way, but you certainly want to stop it at least a week before surgery to at least, you know, a week or two after surgery. And you certainly don't want to be drinking any alcohol while you're on your antibiotics or your pain medication. You don't want to mix that, okay? All right, the second uh, question I, have, I think has to do with like the bra roll area. Yeah. Um, so when we do kind of your standard Lipo 360 or Lipo 360 BBL, we do get to that area and it's kind of included with your LiPo360, so it's not considered additional. 
Um, so yeah, we're starting light that area. Now, anytime you do body type, body type is considered additional. So if you add body type to the area, that would be an additional cost. Uh, but it could be certainly be added to that area as well. Doug, I don't know how to pronounce this, but do right. you operate on someone with Sjogren's syndrome? Syndrome? With yes, Jorgen's syndrome. So, um, so Jorgen's syndrome falls within the, the kind of the category or the umbrella um, of an autoimmune um, you know, disease or issue. Um, and typically, we don't operate on patients that have autoimmune disorders, um, including surgeons, okay? Um, why is that? Because remember, this is completely elective surgeries. It's not like something that you have to do, you know, because, you know, your gallbladder is not functioning or there's a tumor or something like that, okay? Um, unfortunately, people with autoimmune disorders tend to have a harder time with healing, okay? Because they already have kind of a predisposition to the body kind of attacking its own tissues. Uh, and then that's one thing. And then on, on top of that, a lot of times when you have an autoimmune disorder, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis is another, is another one, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, um, these are all examples. Um, you have to be on immunosuppressive medications. When you are on these immunosuppressive medications, uh, again, your body can't defend itself and the risk for infection goes you know, significantly up. So for a completely elective surgery, you typically don't do um, patients that have um, autoimmune disorders such as uh, Sjorgen's or lupus. Okay, Doug, we have plenty, plenty, plenty. Yeah, let's do it. Today's <laughs> all about the questions. Bring okay. them in. What kind of thigh lift do you perform? What kind of yeah, thigh Yeah, so, lift? all right, there's two common, there's two common thigh lifts and uh, I'm going to do a very <laughs> rudimentary drawing of a thigh here. All right, and uh, so, okay, so here's your thighs. Um, and I know this is ter terrible drawing here. Um, and then, okay, so there's a vertical thigh lift, okay, where the incision goes, say this is kind of the, the groin crease area, the incision goes from, the, from just inside the groin crease down to just above the knee, okay? So if you're doing that, that's your vertical thigh lift, okay? And then there's what people call the medial thigh lift, and that's when you're kind of, tucking everything into that groin crease area. So the, the incision is just along the groin crease area. And that's your medial thigh lift, okay? Medial thigh lift is meant for someone who doesn't have a whole ton of uh, thigh excess skin, okay? So you have just a little bit of excess skin, I would say mild to moderate maybe, um, and you wanna you know, be able to conceal that scar a bit better, then potentially you can do a medial thigh lift. But honestly, that's not most of the, what the patients that we get. Most of our patients are massive weight loss patients. These are patients that have lost 80 to 100 pounds, okay? They have quite a bit of excess skin in their thigh. Um, and so that's why the vertical thigh lift is a lot more common. It's typically the thigh lift that I end up doing. So you end up with this vertical scar that goes from the groin down to the knee area. Sometimes we do extend it into like that groin crease area as well um, as needed for the patient. So, I, like I said, now and now with the advent of body type, okay, the body type works fairly well for those mild cases as well. So, so those cases that may have been, say, a medial thigh lift before, now I'd rather do body type, you know, for those cases, um, and then and therefore then you know we only do the surgical thigh lift, which is a vertical thigh lift, when you have a lot, a lot of excess. Uh, yeah. The next one says. Okay, um, this is about the Crohn's disease and yes. says, Hi, doctor, can I get lipo even if I have Crohn's and take Remicade infusion every eight weeks? Right, so so that's kind of what I was talking about a little bit before with kind of the autoimmune issues. So if you're taking something such as Remicade or some other, you know, immunosuppressant, then, um, then I typically do not recommend, you know, elective surgery such as liposuction, BBM, or, or anything else, okay? The other medication that is very, very common when you have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis is one that has uh, aspirin in it. And of course, you can't do uh, surgery with aspirin on board because it increases uh, bleeding tendency. So, um, if you have UC or Crohn's and you're not on any immunosuppressive medications at all, uh, because it's, say, a mild case, then we can consider it. Uh, but certainly if you are on any of those medications or the aspirin-based medications, then uh, we won't be able to perform surgery. Okay, this one. 
Do you use J plasma? So I use um, basically the, a similar device, which is called Body Tight. Uh, they're essentially two brand names of a very, very similar device. They both use what's called radio frequency type energy or RF type energy. Okay. Um, so they both use the same type of energy. They're both meant for the same indications, which is for skin tightening or skin contraction. All right. Um, but why do I like the body type better? So I like the body type um, because it provides more of what we call feedback me mechanisms. So the body type actually has a way where it tells me what the temperature is as I, as I am performing the body type. Not only the, temp the temperature like outside of the skin, but inside as well, because both of these devices have a probe that goes you know, under the skin, kind of similar to a liposuction cantaloupe, okay? And so the body type gives me those temperatures I know exactly when I need to stop so that things don't overheat, okay, and we don't cause, you know, a potential issue like a burn, right? So that's the reason why I like the body type uh, number one. I think it's safer. It warns me before we, we cause a burn, okay? And the other reason I like the body type is because it's a little bit more versatile. It has a, like different probes that can be used for different areas. So it has like the big one, which is the one that's actually called body type. Uh, for like arms and abdomen and things like that, or the thighs. And then it has a little bit smaller one, which we call the face tight, which is typically cut with that one that we use for the neck and the chin area. And then it has an even smaller one, which they call acu tight, uh, which you can use for little tiny areas, like underneath the eyelids and things like that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So different probes for, for that device. Okay. Okay, have you ever worked on someone who is carrier for hemophilia? A care so mm, if you have I mean if you have hemophilia and you're symptomatic then we certainly can't do surgery right um, I, you know the question I guess depends on like whether you're a carrier and that you're actually having issues with that right um, so certainly a, for a, a full-on hemophilia we cannot do the surgery um, if you're a carrier but your blood levels are fine and you have no issues with bleeding at all uh, and um, you know your hematologist says that it's okay then we could potentially consider it but we always so the key is that we always want to check and make sure that everyone is safe before they undergo a completely elective procedure right so that's going to involve several labs and a lot of those labs have to do with your coagulation we got to make sure that you are able to clot in a normal fashion so you don't want to you know clot too much and you don't want to clot too little right it has to be within normal limits anyone who clots too much and it's prone to, uh, you know, DVTs and PEs, big blood clots, we don't want to perform elective surgery. And anyone, of course, who has bleeding issues, uh, we don't want to do that as well. Okay, this is from Vicky. I have a mommy makeover schedule. How painful is the recovery? Right, so, okay, so the mommy makeover typically includes a breast case uh, or a breast procedure and the tummy tuck, okay? Um, of course, pain is subjective, right? So I can't tell you exactly you know, how painful it's going to be. Uh, but what I can tell you, typically the, what, you know, what the toughest part is the tummy tuck aspect of it, okay? Usually the breasts are not a big deal. Um, the breast, if you do implants, it's more of a pressure uh, that you feel, but not, not so much uh, pain. Now with the tummy tuck, um, you're certainly going to be feeling very, very tight, and you're going to be walking, you know, kind of hunched over, uh, for the work first week or two, okay? Uh, you want to, you're gonna want to sleep in a recliner uh, or if you're in the bed with a few pillows behind your back, one or two underneath the knees to relieve a lot of that tension in the belly area. Um, and usually with a tummy tuck, you're not gonna be able to drive to at least three weeks post-op, okay? So the, that, that, you know, the overall recovery for the mind makeover is six weeks in the sense that you can't do any heavy lifting or strength activity and no swimming for the first six weeks, okay? Now, like we mentioned before, something that's really, really helpful for that mommy makeover in terms of recovery is that Expertel shot. So I highly, highly recommend getting the Expertel to reduce the pain in the first 72 hours. Okay, this is a good one. Uh, how long do you need to wait to get a BBL or a lipo after a C-section? Currently, breastfeeding. All right, so you, you, the, the soonest we could do it would be six months, uh, you know, postpartum or after your c-section um, and that will be for a lipo bbl or really in any any kind of elective procedure um, now 
you mentioned breastfeeding, and that's a good point because if we're doing a breast procedure, it's not so much after you know how much time has has lapsed after your C-section. It's more about when you stop breastfeeding. So when you do a breast procedure, you have to you have to stop breastfeeding six months prior to the breast procedure. Okay. Why do you use drains for a skinny BBL if most doctors don't? Yeah. So I, I like to use the one drain down in the in the lower belly area. Um, I just I think it helps the massage therapist uh, honestly. So um, in the first 24 hours, you're, it can both still be very messy. You're still kind of leaking fluid from some of the other sites as well. Um, but you know once you start getting your massage and you start kind of getting all that fluid out, they you know they rather than having them you know continuously trying to open up incisions and stuff like that, uh, that drain basically allows them to push that all that fluid into the drain and then of course out your body through the tube into the, the bowl so um, i think it makes that a lot uh, i think it makes it easier for the massage therapist and i think it's helpful for them and of course it's a lot more controlled so after the first 24 hours all that all that leaking draining fluid just goes into the little bowl um, and it's easier to take care of that way um, it's typically not in there very very long i mean we have to see you here for your follow-up visit on post update five um, and we and we remove the drain at that time. Now, having said that, is it an absolute necessity? Uh, and the answer is no. So once I explain this to most of my patients, they're okay with the drain. But there are some patients, uh, I would say rarely, but there are some patients that say that, you know they just don't want the drain, and I'm okay with that. Um, and what I explain to them is, you know, you're just gonna have we're gonna have to leave your incisions open, and, and the massage therapist is gonna have to kind of drain uh, through there. Okay, I like this one. What's the difference between HD lipo and etching if you're getting a BBL? So, um, let's just say that ab etching falls within the umbrella of HD lipo, right? So, ab etching is very, very specific to the abs, which are, you know, up and down here, what we call the rectus muscles of the abdomen, okay? When you do HD lipo or high definition lipo, that's certainly part of it, but you're also defining the obliques and some other of the you know anatomy of the abdomen. So so HC lipo is just basically you're 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 doing more definition. You're defining other muscles other than just the abs. Okay. Would you recommend lipo 360 without the fat transfer? Sure. Uh, and that you know that depends on the patient and and kind of what they're looking for. Um, and the, you know the shape that they want you know towards the end of the procedure. So if they're completely happy with you know the buttocks and the hips, um, then there's no reason to do a uh, fat transfer. You can just do your lipo 360. Okay, this one. How soon after uh, the gastric sleeve can I do a mommy makeover? Great question. Okay, so gastric sleeve is a form of what we call bariatric surgery for weight loss. Okay. Um, and typically what happens after that surgery, you start to lose weight very, very quickly, right? And then eventually you're going to hit kind of a low point and then you'll come up a bit and then hit the plateau, right? So this is, if you're looking at that in graph form, you know, this is time and this is weight. So you start losing weight, you start losing weight, you'll hit a low point, then you'll come up a bit and then you'll plateau, okay? So we want to be doing surgery here at the plateau point okay now of course this can vary a little bit from patient to patient but typically this is somewhere somewhere around six months okay so for most patients you got to wait at least six months um, after your your bariatric surgery to have in order to you know undergo your tummy tuck or any other cosmetic procedure doc cuando puede hacer un live en español completo Un live completo en español. Ok. <risa> eh, no, seguro, claro que lo podemos coordinar. Eh, quizás lo podemos hacer un viernes. Eh, si no este viernes, les prometo el viernes que viene. ¿Está bien? Okay. Excelente. What's the maintenance process for the HD lipo versus BBL? Yeah. All right, so versus just a straight up lipo 360 BBL. So, I like that question. Why? So, an HD lipo, when you do an HD lipo, it is a big, big commitment by the patient. Okay, big, big commitment. Because 
If you do HC lipo and then you don't follow proper nutrition and exercise, eventually it's just gonna look terrible, right? Why is that? In order to create the different kind of lights and shadows, you know, to, to accentuate the muscles of the HC lipo, you have to leave a little bit of excess, you know, a little bit of extra fat in certain areas and really, really reduce fat in other areas, okay? And when you do that, it looks great on the table. And if the patient uh, maintains a, you know, a healthy nutrition and exercise program, it can be very, very long lasting and it can really, like, really give you that very, very nice athletic look, okay? But if the patient is not committed, all right, and they start you know, not eating well, not exercising at all, perhaps gain, uh, you know, gain some weight, uh, then that fat that you left behind starts growing disproportionately, okay? And it just, it, and it, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good at all, right? It can look terrible. Um, so I've had actually quite a few, well, I don't know if quite a few, but I've had a few patients where we've done HD lipo um, and they, you know, they weren't able to maintain you know, their diet or proper exercise program, and then they've come back to basically you know, reverse it, okay? And that's, that's not too, too, too unusual. Sometimes we'll do HC lipo, then a patient will come back and then say like, hey, you know, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to maintain it. You know, life got in the way, life is complicated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we just get as smooth as possible. And so we go back for like a round two liposuction procedure and kind of smooth everything out, all right? So if you're gonna commit to HD lipo, you have to make sure that you're committed post-op, okay? Um, it, it, you, you have to maintain that you know, healthy diet. You gotta hit the gym every single day, all right? And, uh, and in order to maintain those results in the long term. Okay, do you reduce and correct nipple size and shape when you do your lips, breast lips? So we can certainly, so kind of standard with your breast lift is we're definitely gonna be um, adjusting the size of the areola, okay? And the shape, yeah, I mean, we, we try to make them, you know, round. Um, so we're gonna, we are gonna be changing the size of the areola. And I think that's what the question is referring to. Now, if you mean the actual nipple itself, you know, the central portion there, uh, that typically we don't, we don't touch at the time of a breast lift. But certainly the areola, we, we, we oftentimes reduce the areola and try to make it more round and try to make it more symmetrical from side to side. Okay, top. Let's go for the other one. All right. Mm, okay, um, two years post-op, but my stomach is kind of lumpy. Okay. What can I do to make it more smooth? All right, so I, I'm assuming you had liposuction, right? Okay, I so two saying. years post-op, probably from liposuction and you're feeling some kind of lumpy, bumpy area. So at two years, um, most kind of non-surgical things are not going to work too, too well. So if it was, if you told me it was two months, uh, anything less than a year, then a lot of times that can be much improved with, you know, any non-invasive things such as lymphatic massage, wood therapy, cavitation, um, kind of external ultrasound therapy and other modalities like that. After two years, there's either typically one or two issues going on. One, there's kind of little fat pockets that, are, that were left, um, or uh, there can be some fibrosis. Um, and the third issue though, which has nothing to do really with the liposuction itself, is could there potentially be some skin laxity, some excess skin, right? So the solution to the issue depends on what exactly is going on. If it's, if it's fibrosis or, you know, kind of fat pockets, then going for another round of liposuction can be very helpful, okay? Now, if the issue is skin laxity, further lipo is not gonna make it better. It's actually gonna make it worse, okay? So that's why you have to have an evaluation to know exactly what's going on to know what the treatment is. If the, solution, if the issue is skin laxity, then you need a skin tightening procedure. So if it's um, anywhere, that, if it's super mild, maybe something like body tight, but anything more than that, you're probably gonna need a tummy tuck. Okay, this one says, can I be awake during a BBL? I'm nervous to, put, to be put to sleep. Right, so <laughs> can you be awake, like just in general terms? Yes, there are some surgeons out there that do a weight liposuction and a weight BBL. 
Um, I don't. I don't. So all our patients go under general anesthesia. Um, I think that is a much more effective, much more efficient procedure for the patient. Um, and so I don't recommend, at least for me in my practice, doing a wake liposuction or BPO. Um, now regarding your, your question about, you know, general anesthesia, you know, when you do it with the appropriate provider, um, it, it's, it can be very, very safe, okay? So um, we have two CRNAs here that we've, um, you know, that, that have been with us for a long, long time. Uh, they're extremely safe. I've had my own family members go to them, so uh, I have a lot of confidence uh, in their abilities. Doc, do you repair the entire abdomen in a tummy tuck? So when you do the tummy tuck and, uh, and we do the portion that we call the muscle repair, what we're talking about there is, you know, fixing the separation that's happened, you know, between the muscles, uh, or sometimes those muscles just get stretched and they become weak. So we're fixing that separation and the muscle weakness with, with the repair. Uh, the technical term is called application, but basically what we do is we take this very, very large suture and we start all the way up here. So all the way just beneath that cyphoid process, you know, the breastbone, and we go from there all the way down to the suprapubic area to tighten all that up. Okay. Can flat spots be correct? I had a BBL wrong from one and now I'm seeing some flat spots. Right. So um, I've, done, I've done actually a, a couple of videos on, on kind of flat spots, dimples and cellulite. Um, and so, you know, I can't get into like the whole kind of full on session here, but I highly recommend that, you know, any questions that, that you require more information, definitely go to our YouTube channel. Okay. So go to uh, Pure Plastic Surgery on YouTube um, and you're going to find like entire kind of hump day lives dedicated to some of these questions. Okay. But briefly, to, so the first thing we have to determine is what's causing the flat spot, right? Uh, because a lot of times it has to do with these kind of attachments, these kind of internal attachments that you have that are kind of bringing the, pulling the skin in and there's a, an attachments between the skin and then that underlying muscle, okay? If the attachments are kind of say rather weak, sometimes you can kind of break up those attachments with the cannula so you can go back in, try to break up some of the, those attachments fill with some more fat and then improve the flat spot, okay? However, if there's, you know, if they're stronger or very adherent or there's many of those attachments, then sometimes we, there's only so much that we can do, okay? Uh, and remember, BBL is not, not a treatment for cellulite, okay? There are other treatments that can work better for that. So you have these attachments that are causing a flat spot and it's due to something like cellulite, then I recommend uh, a treatment such as Quo, uh, which actually deals with those attachments directly, okay? Um, now you may ask, why not just go in there and just kind of cut all those attachments, right? So the issue is that if you, if you do that, you're overly aggressive and you remove all those attachments, then you can create something called a blowout deformity, okay? And when you go, yeah, when you go from like a divot to a ball, like a ball, like a softball that's kind of blowing out. Um, and that's actually a worse problem, much, much worse problem because it's extremely difficult to hide and very, very difficult to treat. Okay, when you have a blowout, um, a lot of the fat that gets stuck in there can become like a cyst or it can become infected um, and create a lot, a lot of issues. So you definitely want to avoid a blowout deformity, which is much worse than having a little bit of a flat spot. Doug, our last question for today. Last one already. Yes, sir. All Can right. a breast reduction and a tummy tuck be done at the same time? Yeah, of course. That's kind of one of our, you know, you, when you combine a breast uh, procedure and a tummy tuck, we call that a mommy makeover. And the breast procedure can be whatever the breast needs or whatever the patient's looking for. It can be a breast reduction, breast lift, breast lift with implant, or a straight breast augmentation. It can be any of those procedures, okay? So, yeah, we'll certainly be able to uh, combine the breast reduction and the tummy tuck at the same time. Okay, and this is like a resume of a few questions I read. One is the BMI limits. Remind our people, please. Yeah, so uh, max BMI for me is 30, okay? Uh, and the max BMI for Dr. Verdal here is 33.5. Remember the spots in Agos? The of course, yeah. So, like I said, so it looks like we have a couple of openings here in August. Uh, and that's, that's pretty rare because if you don't hit August, then you may be stuck until December. All right. Or January. Uh, January. Yeah. December or January. So we do have a few spots. So you want to kind of grab those spots and you're 
ready to go, uh, make sure that you contact us uh, via the virtual consultation form at www.pureplasticsurgery.com. Okay? All right, everybody. Well, I missed you guys. Uh, I hope you missed me. <laughs> it's been a couple of weeks, but I'm glad to be back. Uh, and so make sure you join me next week uh, on Hump Day with Dr. Alex Earl. Take care, everyone. Ciao.